Good day, good people. My name is Brad King, and this is the Downtown Riders Jam video podcast, which is part of the Solid Listen Podcast Network. Max the Dog and I are coming to you from deep inside the Jam Bunker 2.0. Only one of us is awake right now. I am so excited to have Shannon McLeod on the program today. I interviewed her, I think in 2016, one of the very early interviews of the Riders Jam podcast. Her book, chapbook, Pathetic, had won an award in Indianapolis and she was there and I had a chance to catch up with her. And I have fallen in love with her writing. She is so good, so gentle and kind with her words and prose, and yet has these amazingly poignant stories. I am, I, I told her today, like, I feel like her, like, weird writer uncle because it's just so much fun to have seen her journey over the last five or six years. And her book, Whimsy, is out now. And getting this book out has been an ordeal that writers sometimes have to go through. Uh, she's the author of Whimsy. Long Day Press has it out right now. So you should go order it, read it. It's fantastic. Um, her writing has appeared in Tin House, Prairie Schooner, Hobart, uh, Smoke Long Quarterly, and other places. She's originally from the, uh, Detroit but she now lives in Virginia and teaches high school English, which in and of itself is doing the Lord's work. Um, I just want to talk a little bit about her sort of off the cuff because I'm a writer who loves writers. And if you listen to the program or if you've met me or seen me around, you know that people that write and that make that if not their living, their vocation, the thing that they want to do, I just, I am fascinated by them and I love them. And I just think um, they're my people. And when we met and when I interviewed Shannon, like it was just one of those moments where I'm like, oh my God, I'm meeting this young person at the beginning of this journey that she's about to go on. And you know, I don't want to be weird about it, but like I knew before she knew, right? Like I knew, oh, this is, this is in her soul. This is a thing that she's going to do forever. And she let me read a very, very early version of Whimsy, the book that's out now. And I fell in love with the writing. Like I love Pathetic, her chapbook, but Whimsy was the moment when I was like, oh my God, this young writer has not only figured out the question that she wants to answer in this book, but also the voice that she wants to answer that question in. And that is such a, an amazing monumental thing to do. It takes so many writers, it takes all of us, so many years to figure those things out. What am I trying to answer? What am I trying to say? Like, am I being authentic with myself? And here was this little, tiny person who was very quiet and like interviewing her I had to keep telling her like lean into the microphone you have to, like nobody can hear you you have to do this but who had written this amazing thing and I just thought like yeah like I'm going to hype this person forever because she is a thing that I don't have right like she is a thing where she has just nailed that and it doesn't mean that she's going to nail it for everything. And like everybody else, when you make it a career, like it's work and it's hard work. But to figure that out so early, holy shit, like I was in, I was in. So I will always be a Shannon McLeod fan. And I will be the sort of weird literary uncle that's just in the back like, oh my God, that's great. And I think that you guys will too, when you read this book when you hear her talk about it, like when you track down her writing, she's just fantastic. Before we get to that, we got a couple things that we're gonna cover. Uh, we do the Downtown Writer Jam podcast every Wednesday. You can listen to that wherever you listen to podcasts on Apple, Stitcher, Amazon, all those places. Two things you can do to help us out. Leave us a review wherever you listen to podcasts. Tell your friends about us. Podcast series comes out whenever we get around to talking to folks. Right now we're doing it every couple of weeks, but we'll get to that when we get to it. Essentially what we're using this for is a way to promote books that are coming out now. The podcast has a little bit of a longer lead time. So this is a way for us to talk about books that we think are interesting right now. 
If you are really interested in buying the books of the people you hear on this show or the podcast, which you should be, head on over to writersjam.com, click on our bookshop link, and you'll be able to buy all those books. You can also get book reviews. We try to read the books of everybody who's on the show and leave a review for that. You can sign up for our monthly newsletter. When you do that, you'll get book recommendations, reviews, podcast highlights, and other happenings around the web, around the web, because we are always scouring for what we think is interesting. So if you want to keep up with all that stuff without having to do all the work yourselves, like sign up for the newsletter. Also, lastly, you can support the entire Solid Listen network. Click on the Patreon button. When you do that for just a couple bucks a month, you'll get commercial free episodes, happy hours, and bonus content from everybody on the network. Thank you for stopping by. Thank you for coming to the video series, signing up for the Solid Listen podcast YouTube channel, stopping by the bunker to spend some time with Max and I. I hope that your day is going well. Hope that you are taking care of yourself. Hope that you were taking care of each other. And now sit back and enjoy my conversation with Shannon McLeod. All right. So Whimsy is out now, right? The official release date is next Tuesday, March 23rd. However, pre-order folks are getting their books already. So it feels like it's out. Yeah. What are you doing to celebrate? Next week, I'm doing like a t-shirt giveaway. My husband designed t-shirts with the cover. And um, so I'm going to, I'm going to do a little like drawing each night of next week from folks who pre-ordered and just as a sort of celebratory thing. I think my Zoom fatigue is so great that the idea of creating like a you know, a Zoom reading to celebrate uh, didn't feel super exciting to me. So giving away t-shirts feels more exciting. Are you guys going to do something there? Like, are you going to make him make dinner or like bring you champagne oh, or something? Oh, okay. Yeah. You know, we'll probably do the customary Taco Bell and champagne. Oh, that's customary. It's, it's become customary. Just strangely, like the last few times I've gotten good book news, I we've gotten, we've happened to get Taco Bell and open a bottle of champagne. So now, now it feels like it's, it is customary. So I think we need to follow through with that tradition. I mean, whatever works, like if it's working, like continue to do it's that. And like, yeah, I know. It's becoming a thing where it's like, I don't want to jinx it. <laughs> so Whimsy has had a, I feel, I sort of feel like your literary weird uncle because <laughs> I interviewed you like six years ago um, in Indianapolis for the Writer's Jam. And then, you know, I got to read sort of an early version of what I'm guessing is a radically different book than what's out now. Um sort of through the curbside thing. Like I knew the curbside folks like, so I've sort of watched this book that I think is beautiful and amazing. And I love your writing to the point that I've sort of weirdly like talk about it all the time. Oh, thank you. Um, so like, tell me about the journey for whimsy because it's been fucking weird. <laughs> it's been really weird. Yeah. <laughs> And um, I mean, the, the strange and beautiful thing about it is that like now that it is out, the people like you have who have been there with me, like supporting me along the way or who have read it or given me input or helped me along the way, like have been really awesome cheerleaders. Um, but yeah, so anyway, I, I wrote it uh, like five years ago um, after I had just finished a couple novels that felt like flops. And I decided I wanted to do a novel and stories to kind of like double dip. Like, okay, if this novel doesn't work out, maybe I'll get a few good short stories out of it. Um, so I started with a couple stories and then started thinking about more of the narrative arc. Um, it didn't ultimately become something that really feels like a novella in stories, even though that's how, what I wanted to call it. Um, because by, I think the second half, like it really has more force and makes more sense um, all as one novella. Um, so anyway, that, that was the writing of, of the manuscript. And then um, a, a couple years after I started writing it, I submitted it to a few small presses and contests and Curbside Slender had a novella contest, which of course, not a lot of publishers take novellas or publish novellas. So that was a huge thrill when I got a call from Tim Kinsella, who was the judge, and was like, I picked your manuscript. And I got I got this call, I think the day after I had gotten um, MFA rejections. 
So there's also a strange parallel with me and like MFA rejections too, because I've submitted um, two rounds of MFA per, um, applications and both times like right after the rejection I'll like get good book news. Um, so it was going to come out from Curbside Splendor. It was supposed to be 2019. I believe yeah. spring of 2019 was supposed to be the publication date. Um, but fall of 2018, the uh, the owner of per Curbside Splendor just <laughs> kind of started ghosting me and wouldn't give me a contract. And um, I started talking to other authors from the press and red flags started popping up and then I finally got an email back that said, uh, we will be on an indefinite hiatus. So I, I read between the lines that yeah. it was pretty clear the message between the lines, but that it wasn't coming out with them, but. That must have sucked. It really, really did. Yeah. Um, it was also pretty embarrassing because, you know, like friends and family members who don't really get writing, like they knew that I had been writing stuff and spending a lot of my time writing for many right. years and I'm like oh I'm, I'm gonna have a book and it felt like a long time even though it wasn't really in the long long term um but yeah to announce that my book was coming out and then to say mm, just kidding it's not really going yeah. out uh it, it was pretty devastating and it was pretty embarrassing as well well because um, I, you know I only knew you would you know I only know you through this stuff and like yeah um, you know, conversations and stuff that we had. But when I first interviewed you, I think it was 2016, like you were very, you're already way more outspoken and way more like out there with yourself than you were five years ago, right? Like you were yeah. really dipping your toes into to this sort of public water that you weren't yeah. entirely comfortable with. Mm -hmm. And so having that be your first experience had to just be like, are you fucking kidding me? Like, this yeah. is how come I don't do this, guys. <laughs> right. right. <laughs> exactly. I mean, so much of it is disappointment and like, feels like, like a friend of mine who actually a, a good writer friend of mine, I met because her book was supposed to come out from curbside Splendor too. Unfortunately, she had already signed a contract. So it was a little more complicated for her to um, be able to take her book back. But um, it's been nice becoming friends with her and, and her <laughs> saying is like it's a it's a pyramid scheme like publishing like yeah a lot of it feels like a pyramid scheme and um I think a lot of folks start small presses with very good intentions but then it's hard to tell who is well intentioned from who is maybe not so well intentioned from the other category which is probably a larger category of well intentioned but very poorly executed or just don't have the time or skill or um, money, you know, frankly, to back up a small press. So it is an area that's, uh, it's very difficult to try to publish through a small press. And I find myself very, very lucky to be with Long Day Press now because they've been awesome. So how do you go from that? Because I knew a bunch of, the, I mean, I knew the curbside folks and, and, several of the folks who were actually the book people left right yeah. like as that was happening I was like uh-oh like this doesn't feel like something's happening and then you announced your thing and, and I knew some of the folks that came in behind and I'm like well maybe it'll be okay and then it wasn't okay and I don't I don't know they if left. I sent, what's that yeah they left too yeah um, and I don't know if I sent you a letter after that or a card or whatever but like how do you go from okay shit I thought this was going to be a thing because I remember you said when I read that early draft and you were like, it's a novella and short stories. And I was like, that's not a thing. And I read it and I was like, no, this is a thing. Like, this is really good, but it's also going to be really hard to sell yeah. because it's, it literally is a novella and short stories. So how do you get to the, to the new place? Long day. That's who you're with. Yeah. Yeah. And so, well, I mean, for a while, I didn't want to submit it because I just, you know, it was like too devastating. I'm yeah. like, I can't pay any more entry fees. Even if it's just like 10 or 20 bucks, I just like, I'm too resentful and bitter yeah. right now. And I can just can't like put myself out there in that way. I just felt burnt out. Um, so I guess it was like a year later. It was, I mean, after the pandemic had started, I reached out to um, Joshua Bonsack, who is uh, the who who's the main guy in Long Day Press? He he's the editor, 
And he was the first person to work on my manuscript with curbside. Um, so I already knew him. I already had been working with him. So he was my, thought, I need more curbside in my life is what oh you Oh my said. gosh. <laughs> okay, he's wonderful. So he yeah. was the first one who did the first pass on my a book for curbside. And then he's like, Hey, sorry, I'm leaving curbside, but Joseph Dems is your wonderful new editor. And he was a wonderful new editor. So I did another pass with him. And then he said, Hey, now that we're done doing edits, I, I got to go. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So really when I said the, the red flags um, came up once I started to talk to authors, that, that wasn't true. The red flags were them the editors. <laughs> one after another. But so those two are, they're wonderful yeah. humans. They're wonderful editors. And I think that they basically just stuck around for the authors that they started with. I'm sure they did. Yeah. I, yeah. I mean, it was just an act of love. I don't think that they got you know i don't i don't know how much they were paid if anything for yeah. what they were doing i think they had a lot a lot of promises made to them that weren't delivered upon so it also just felt right to go back to them because they had started this small press they oh, had so already worked on it. both of them run long day press yeah gotcha. oh so this was like a natural evolution for the book yes absolutely so it like almost made too much sense i had read a long day press book What's on the menu by uh, Chase Griffin, which you should read. It's it's it would be right up your alley. It's really funny and weird and just awesome. Um, so I read there. I'm gonna book. take that as a compliment. It, yeah, no, yeah. those are my favorite kind of people yeah. and writers. Um, but so they they put out that novella mm -hmm. last summer, I believe, and I read that and I talked to the author a little bit, and he was like, "Oh, you should send your book." He said, "Oh, I want to read your manuscript," so I sent him a Word doc, and he was like, "Send it to Long Day Press." So. Um, I did that last, I think it was May or something. Um, and then they were like, yeah, hell yeah, we want to publish it. So it, it ended up a, a happy ending, I think. <laughs> yeah, it, but it is, it is you know, we talk about on the program, uh, on the podcast, about understanding the publishing world. And like, as a writer, you don't know that the world is actually broken up into about a thousand different things, right? Like mm -hmm. there's the big five, there's small and independent, right? There's genre stuff. There's people that like do stuff only ebook with agents, without agents. And you got to find your way into the thing that like works for your voice and your soul. Right. That it's not just about being a good writer, but like finding yourself in that. Yeah. That, that strange little pod that you fit into among <laughs> yeah. hundreds of thousands of them. Yeah. And sometimes it's like, you know, I got friends that write at the big five and like who do stuff, but it's all, that's also a strange world where like, yeah. you know, you get together with a bunch of marketers and everybody figures out like, okay, where's this genre going? And like, what do we think can now write into that? And it's like, that shit's a skill too. Like it's all a skill, but like, it is something that no, I've never talked to a writer and 150 people that I've interviewed who have like understood publishing before they went into it. <laughs> Right. Yeah. yeah. You know, another like uh, nice, nice thing about the pandemic, aside from being able to do things like this, is that I um, got into a, a group of authors who are trying to, uh, who have books coming out. So we're like, okay, people were trying to figure out how to put out a book during a pandemic. And most of them, I believe, um, are with big five publishers. And so I do get to hear the other side of it, which yeah. is interesting that they're like, most of them disliked the first version of their cover and they really had to fight against it. Um, or they, you know, this or that, they had to advocate for themselves in ways. And they're all like scared to talk to their, you know, their publisher or advocate yeah. for themselves because they're like, I don't know how this works. So yeah. it's amazing how like writers at all levels are, are just trying to figure it out, like you said, as they're entering that world. I literally host salons for writers. I just did one about a month ago. Uh, a writer had a question about like her interactions with editors and agents. So I gathered a bunch of people together and I said, I'm only bringing authors together and we're going to have a beer and we're going to answer all her questions. And at the end, she was like, I had no idea this is how this worked. I'm like, yeah, they don't want us to know this stuff. <laughs> It seems that way. Yeah, like everyone's too scared to send an email. So then their inboxes are a little smaller than they, I know they're massive. So yeah, no, it literally, it was all that stuff. Like, well, I'm not getting this from my editor. Like 
I guess that's just the way it is. And we're like, no, no, no. You have to advocate for yourself because you like, it doesn't, and you, yeah. if your agent's not doing it, you need to have a conversation with the agent and then with the editor. They were like, well, what if I get, you know, what if they drop me? I'm like, they're not, they, they all need content. At the end of the day, you're the talent. You're yeah. the talent. <laughs> like there's no book publishing without you. <laughs> Right. But I, I wonder, I mean, I do, I was thinking about this recently that like, you know, for so long when you're a writer, you're just like desperate for anybody to read your stuff. Anyone to want to read your stuff. So then when like you get in the position when you're able to publish, it's like, you're so afraid to ask for yeah. anything because you're like, I'm just supposed to be grateful for whatever yeah. you give me. Yeah. Which is bullshit. Yeah, it totally is. But, you know, it's a, a trained habit. Yeah, 100%, right? Like, because there is, once you've dealt with your manuscript for so long, I mean, you've been dealing with whimsy forever. I'm sure at this point, you're like, I don't even want to look at that thing anymore. <laughs> right? Like, by the time a book comes out, an author goes on a tour, and they're like, I don't ever want to think about this book ever again. <laughs> that, I mean, that. I, th I thought that would be my my feeling, but it wasn't. Oh, well, that's good. I think that was that is the case for a lot of people, but I think. I mean, I can report it is a that's the case <laughs> for a lot of people. Yeah. I mean, I like there's like the novel I'm working on right now. I started in last February. I'm sick of that, you know. But yeah, I think because I got a little bit of a break from this, maybe it helped to come back to it like with fresh eyes and be like. Oh, I can I can sympathize with and and appreciate the writer who wrote this five years ago more and maybe be a little more gentle with my past self than I might be with my present self. That's good, because when you sent me the original whimsy, it was like couched. With, I had this recollection of telling you, like, don't tell me it's bad before I've read it. Like something like I remember you like apologizing as you asked me to read it for like all these things. And I'm like, what are you doing? Like, that's crazy. Um, so I know that you love whimsy, like you love whimsy, like she is, she's kind of your girl. Yeah. <laughs> so I, so I only do this on the video podcast. Like, tell us who whimsy is, like, what's this thing we're going to read? Cause, okay. cause it's, if it's even close to what it was before, and I'm assuming it has not changed, at least in the essence of that, like it was a, you write beautiful and gentle prose. Like it's really fantastic shit. And Whimsy was such a, not an empathetic character, but like a character that you just want to love. Like she's just somebody that you want to love. So who is Whimsy? How does this happen? Yeah, yeah. I mean, that's that's really interesting because that you say like you want to love. Because I also remember you using the word unlikable. Yeah. Word too, and I, and I anticipate, um, anticipated and still anticipate that some readers will will love her and identify with her. And I think some who also identify with her maybe will be repulsed by that in that like they're seeing parts of themselves that they don't want to see yeah. or seeing that like unlikable thing. So And um, I like to be clear, I like unlikable characters. Yeah, like me that too. Thing, me because too. they tend to be human, right? They tend to give us a sort of a, a, a picture of the world. And I know for women writing women characters, like unlikable has a thing right like that's that is not what I meant by that it was like oh you allowed her to be a woman and right. not to be the manic pixie dream of whatever right totally yes and I mean so I like I remember you saying that but I totally didn't take it as uh, I didn't take offense to it because <laughs> I agree I like those protagonists that are often called unlikable yeah so to backtrack, Whimsy is the name of the protagonist and also the name of the book. And um, she is a character who's about in her mid twenties and she's a new teacher of middle school students. And um, she's grappling with the trauma of an accident that happened in college. So she was in a car accident with her roommate um, that leaves her with a lot of injuries and some scarring and uh, her roommate dies in the accident. So the majority of the storyline takes place when she's older and she meets this journalist who's doing a human interest piece about her accident and um, the subsequent experiences. Um, so she falls in love with the journalist. And so we just kind of see her throughout the story 
dealing with her insecurities about her physical stature um, and also how that shapes the way that she interacts with her love interest, with her students, with her friends and family, um, and really isolates herself and um, kind of like you see her judgments of herself reflected on in her judgments of others as well. So uh, I think she could probably be pretty, it, it could probably be kind of uh, draining for some people to read this kind of first person perspective through this kind of mind. Um, for me, I like stories like that because it feels comforting because I am similarly neurotic. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, I, I it, so it was really just kind of an expression of, um, I see the ways that my own insecurities keep me trapped in my own mind and keep me from connecting from other with other people and empathizing with other people the way that I could. Um, so that part of myself was sort of the seed of this character. Yeah. And I mean, we, I think we had talked a little bit about that. Like, again, I recall reading it being like, oh, this is. I mean, just just the basis of the character is you like there's just enough of that stuff where you're like, oh, you're in your 20s and you're a teacher and like, yeah, yeah. but right. also like, you know, the premise of the program, you know, you were on sort of an early iteration of what we've done. But the premise of the program is really that writers become writers because they are trying to answer a question and that they feel outside of the world and that no matter what you're writing, it, there's something that you're just trying to figure out. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that was why Whimsy connected so much with me when I read it for you, like as a writer, again, not thinking about me, but just like, oh, you know the question that you're answering. Like you are literally yeah. dealing with these things about yourself through this character. And as much as any writer, I mean, also it's a fiction story and it needs to be good. But like, <laughs> I just found that to be, so advanced from such a young writer that you had sort of nailed that thing so quickly. Oh, thanks. I mean, it's why I've been so weird and championing you for six years and telling people like, you're gonna be like, people are going to want to know who you are because that is, you have the voice and you have the question and the rest of it is just execution. But like execution is the easiest part of that three things. Yeah. I I think you're right. I think you're right. And that that really rings true when I think about my past writing projects that haven't worked out. Like the the question wasn't strong enough. You're yeah. so right. And and like trying to figure out the thing I'm working on right now, is the question strong enough? Um, is it a thing that you grapple with so intensely that you can get to that emotional truth that feels real yeah. to the writer, to the reader? And yeah, I mean. It's when I it's why when I read Whimsy, it's why I said, like, that's your girl. Like, that is your girl. Like, you talk to Whimsy right. today, right? Like, <laughs> um, and I just think that's fantastic. And it's such a um, you know, Twain said, like, everybody has one story in them. And it's then you figure out if you're a writer after that, if you have more things to find out. And I suspect that you will. Um, but that one just like, cause I think the first chat book that I read was, uh, it was pathetic, right? That yeah. was the one that like, um, you came out with, which was sort of, right. I sort of but I get like, but I get like spiritually where that led to the question of whimsy. Like yeah. I sort of understand the line between those two, when you read yeah, your yeah. chat book and then whimsy, it's like, okay, I can see that thought process happening. Totally. Yeah. yeah. Um, well, listen, it has been fantastic to catch up with you. I know that I like bug the shit out of you all the time just because I think you're fantastic. And like, I'm so, Fine. I'm so happy to see this book come out. I cannot, I'm hopeful that it's at my old apartment and that my friend can pick it up and I can read it because I want to see what the new iteration looks like. We, we can get it where? Everywhere? Pretty much. Yeah. I mean, you, you can get it on Amazon if you want. <laughs> Too. But uh, bookshop.org, Long Day Press. Let me double check the website. It's not even on the book. Longdaypress.com. I should have that memorized. Longdaypress.com <laughs> is the best place to get it, but you can get it pretty much anywhere. Because when you buy it from the small presses, they get all the money themselves, everybody. And I can confirm that the small press is not evil. <laughs> well, it was wonderful to talk to you. Thank you so much for doing this. And uh, I cannot wait to read this book. Thanks, Brad.
That was Shannon McLeod, whose book Whimsy is out now. Before we get out of here, just a couple of reminders. Do us those two favors. Leave us a review wherever you listen to podcasts. Tell your friends about us. While you're at it, don't forget to check out the other programs on the Solid Listen Podcast Network, including the flagship Mother May I Sleep With podcast with host and our Solid Listen Podcast queen, Molly MacLear. Don't forget, we've got video podcasts coming out on the Solid Listen Network YouTube channel, where you can catch the audio version wherever you listen to the Downtown Writers Jam podcast. The jam is now out on Wednesdays, so get yourself subscribed wherever you listen to podcasts. And remember, you can always catch us on Twitter and Instagram at the Writers Jam. Till the next time, I will see you around the internet. Thank you.